Hello, everybody, and welcome to our event today. Uh, I'm your host, Madalina Andre, former Global Mobility Coordinator, currently Partnership Manager with Expat Global. Uh, for those of you uh, not yet familiar with Expat Global, we are the first soft-enabled marketplace uh, digital ecosystem in global mobility sector. To put it simply, the first platform that enables the direct relationship between local and regional uh, experts and professionals providing uh, specialized services such as immigration, visa, destination, social security, tax services, uh, and corporate clients out there and their expatriates in need of such services around the world. This is the 18th episode um, of Expat Nexus uh, series, a series which has as main goal to become the place where we can share best practices in our industry, learn from each other, and most importantly, grow together. Uh, our episode today focuses solely on a particular, more and more visible aspect in the relocation industry, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, this has become critical to the strategy of many organizations in an era when business models are defined by expansion or digital uh, uh, disruption. And these transactions create lots of new issues for both parties, but one thing is certain, they are both a change and an opportunity. Uh, our industry has seen recently many such changes and opportunities, right? Uh, therefore, we decided to create a special topic and event around this uh, um, uh, this subject with our dear friends from the uh, European Relocation Association. And together with Dominic Tidy, I'll be moderating the session today. And I have to tell you that we have some great questions and amazing answers from our guest speakers today. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing from you. So if you're watching us, please say hi, drop your comments, drop your questions in the comment section. And without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Dominic to make the proper uh, introduction. Madalina, thank you so much. It's really great to be here. We've um, for those of you who are just coming in, and hello, everybody. Hello, Jennifer. Hello. Hey, Anita. I was just going to say, we had <laughs> technical issues there for a minute, but they seem to be solving. So lovely to see you, Anita. Um, hi, Jean-Luc. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see everybody coming in. And as I say, Madalina, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. It's uh, it's really, You're welcome. really great. Um, so I will introduce you to our fantastic panel in just a second. And um, But first, for those of you... I'm used to doing this with, with Euro members, so I never have to do a, a, like an explanation of what Euro is. So, but, but there's a lot of you here um, who, who are not part of Euro. So for those of you who don't know what Euro is, we are a, a not-for-profit association representing relocation service providers all over the world. We started off back in 1998, so next year is going to be the 25th anniversary, which is extraordinary. And in that time, we've seen the membership grow to over 500 companies in 95 countries. Um, we are tremendously lucky to have had the most incredible support over the last two years. It's been a horrendous time for our industry and to have had the faith of the Euro membership kindness has meant the world to all of us. So we provide a whole range of services to our members, but predominantly, and I never get the arrow right, the Euro quality seal um, is the um, is an externally audited quality assurance program for destination service providers and relocation providers. Um, we also have the Euro Academy, and we um, provide a three-level training programs to our members all over the world. The man managing international mobility. Um, over the past uh, two years, we've pretty well made that free. Uh, it's it's free for Euro members, but if you want to certify and gain your credits, then we have to let you charge but there's masses of information about that we have managing international mobility we have managing international mobility plus and we have managing international mobility fellow of which anita is one so thank you very much <laughs> anita is the fellow. Uh, there's if you need any information on that just drop me an email um we are incredibly grateful to the work of our strategic consultants who focus on quality training education intellectual content and of course most important of all, networking, which is one thing we have sorely missed over the last few years. And we are very, very much, very much hoping and looking forward to our three, four times delayed uh, conference in Seville, which will be happening in at the end of May and the beginning of Everybody's May. waiting for that, like mad, Dominic, everybody. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to introduce you today to 
three fantastic Euro members. Um, Marie O'Neill. Marie is the managing director of Executive Expatriate Relocations based in Dubai, operating across the Middle East. And those of you who know Marie from our briefings and uh, from our conferences, Marie, you've been a fantastic supporter of our conferences and have spoken on many panels. So thank you so much for being here today. Very interesting area of expertise that Marie will be bringing to you through the session. Um, Damien Abisher is the CEO of Pack Impex. Damien, it's fantastic to have you here. Thank you so much as well for being here. Again, a very, very fascinating time for your group over the past. Hey, Patrick, how are you? <laughs> Hi. Hello. Great to see you. Great to see you. Glad you made it. We had a few technical issues, so I'm very pleased you're here. Um, so, again, Wi-Fi because our Wi-Fi went down just to you know, Oh. We were just saying before we started the call that um, these things now, you know, we're so used to doing all of this technically, but all it takes is Wi-Fi to go down or the power to go off, everything stops. Yeah. So, sorry, David, <laughs> I guess just back to Packing Pecs, it's been a fascinating, fascinating time for you. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your insights um, today as well. That's fantastic. Anita Meyer, Anita, Vice President of, of Altair Global Belgium. Thank you so much for being with us again very interesting. You're, we've known each other for a, a long time. Anita is past president of Euro. And again, your expertise in this area is, is, is unique and unmatched. So thank you so much for being here. And last but by no means least, Patrick Oman, um, who is the CEO of Patrick Oman Consulting. Patrick has extraordinary experience in mergers and acquisitions, having done it many times as well as also being a past president of Euro. And we've been able to have really some fascinating conversations over the years about your experiences. So thank you to all of you for being here today. I'm really looking forward to it. Madalena. Super, excellent. Thanks a lot, Dominic, for, uh, for this. Uh, and uh, to you, Rob, for partnering with us for this, uh, for this event. And a big thank you to our, uh, to our guests here. Uh, I'll start by saying that I'm pretty sure everybody would just like to know the answer to the question, how is the company valid in our industry, right? So we could just answer that first and close the session, end of, end of story. Uh, but we're not going to do that because uh, uh, we would like to keep you uh, on your toes, right, until the end. Uh, and I promise you that by the end of the session, you'll find uh, the answer to your, uh, to your question from, from our uh, uh, amazing guests here. Um, we can start, I guess, with, with uh, the guest that sold his company several times, right, Patrick? Oh. Uh, and, and a question regarding the, um, so when one starts a company in our industry, um, do you think that person is aware from the outset that they are going to sell uh, the business at some point in the future? Is this a thought in the minds of business owners in our industry? Is this a regular thought that, that people have uh, when they're starting up businesses? And if it is, do they do anything differently? Well, th that's three or four questions in one, but... Um, <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> I think our industry is at a stage where quite, quite a number of the, uh, of the business owners uh, started their business 25, 30 years ago. And when you add 25 or 30 years to uh, the sort of age they were then, you're at the age now where they want to retire. And um, that, that is just a, a, a dynamic of, of the industry because um, th those of us who, who were around when, when relocation began and uh, stayed with it all this time have reached that age. So there are quite a number of people anxious to uh, sell their businesses, move on, uh, and the, the ways which are open to them are really management buyout or merger or straight sale. And I mean, I could go on now for the full hour. <laughs> yeah, really, that, that is the way that the industry is at the moment. It is. It's fascinating. Um, Madalena, did you want to... Uh, and, uh, Anita, how, how was that topic for you? When you built, uh, when you started mm -hmm. AMMP, did you see your succession planning, the, the, the eventual sale of the company, or was that not in your frame? Not. Not at all. Not until six months before the company was transferred <laughs> into other hands. <laughs> Never all through those 22 years, all in all, had I had ever the intention to sell, very clear. Nor succession plans, 
Um, I have two children who help out, uh, one at Eura conferences, the other one um, tried to bring us into the 21st century uh, email and internet wise. Um, <laughs> but there was never uh, an intention to join in. So that was never an option either. Isn't that interesting? It's just, again, you know, and, and Patrick, coming back to you, I mean, you did, did you build your your company with the eventual thought that you might set up? Well, I, I think when I started at the beginning and uh, went on for the first many, many years, I, I, I wasn't thinking about an ultimate sale. And then in the first business that I had, which was uh, the international moving business, um, we began to find that uh, really to, to matter in that world, you had to be of a certain size. And yeah. my competitor came to me with the same thought and asked about uh, merging. And so that was the first time that I really got involved in in selling the company. It was at that time a merger. And uh, because both companies were of a particular size and we, one of the big problems with dealing with your competitor is you don't really want to give him the information that he needs to uh, <laughs> for the first together. And uh, we had to appoint an independent assessor, which we did in uh, PwC. PwC sounds like they would be far too expensive and enormous. But yeah. If we all think about it, they're probably a customer of each of us. And uh, if not them, at least one of the other big companies uh, is a customer of each of us. So it's easy enough to find somebody who can be independent and who can uh, then uh, evaluate each company and, um, and then allocate a, a percentage of the eventual whole to each group of shareholders. And, um, and then the haggling begins and they mediate and eventually then you get to a point where uh, you're reaching agreement but then you've got to start revealing how the how the uh, price was made up and each person has to show their hand see what what customers were there what contracts were there that were what came into the evaluation and that's how it got you see that's fascinating we're going to come on to that we obviously that's why uh, you know mm -hmm very central theme of, of this. But um, if I can come to Damien and to Marie, I mean, it's a very different environment for you two, but Damien, you've bought and sold in, 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 in specifically over the last, you, you know, you've been on a, a you've bought a lot. Um, was that, was that, has that been part of Pack and Pex's strategy for a while? Um, it, it's been now for a while, but it, it's not always been part of our strategy. I'd say for for the large part of of our history, we've we've been very a very Swiss focused uh, company. Um, but obviously, with the market changing, with the industry changing as a company, you need to reevaluate your strategic options and and you need to rethink your positioning. And for us, that included. Uh, you know, set spinning off and selling part of the business and, and then subsequently um, expanding our footprint. So it, it's certainly not been there from the very beginning of the company, but it has now been part of our strategy for a number of years. Yes. See, I think, again, that's fascinating. And Maria, if I can come to you, because, you know, your your experience is very different. And we're going to go into that in, in, in detail. But in terms of your, did you shift? your company's strategy in terms of where you are now um, because of COVID or was it part of a long-term strategy? Um, yes, it was part of a, a long-term strategy, but I think COVID um, definitely pushed us, um, you know, nearer or further down the line um, than we had planned it to be. Oh. And it's interesting just speaking there about succession planning, you know, we've only just um, bought the company, taken over ownership, and we are already looking at succession planning and, you know, plans for our future, say, not, say, I'm not saying it's next week or next year, but, you know, down the line. So we're already working on that um, and see the importance of it. Fascinating. Well, Natalie, that to me. Gonna... Patrick. Thank you. Um, just exactly what uh, Marie said there. You know, when you, when you go through the process, you see the value of it and you see exactly. what's valuable in your company and you see what's important in your company. Um, as Anita said, and and uh, you know, none of us none of us think about selling during all those years of building up our company. None of us 
it doesn't enter our head. We're so enthusiastic, we're so passionate about our business, we just love it and we enjoy the whole the whole business. But once you sell a company or buy a company, then all the components which go into making it valuable suddenly become very apparent to you. And uh, things like succession. Um, one of the questions which uh, I know Madalena was asking me was, and you're sitting away from me right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, how important is the owner and what, you know, what impact does the owner's value have on the company? And as most of us have built our own companies, we think that we are the most valuable person. But you've got to concentrate on making your, your, your structure, your management structure, uh, just as valuable as you are and convincing your buyer that they can continue to deliver the profits that you've uh, hopefully proven you're making and that the the, um, the uh, management structure is there so that the owner is no longer necessary. Yeah, and we're going to de yeah. dive deeply into that because it's it, it's a huge, huge thing, um, especially in our industry where you are known. You are well known as the head of that company. Madeleine, right. over to you. Thanks a lot for your, uh, for your insight so far. So from the moment um, an owner decides to right what can they do to prepare in advance and make sure their company is valued at the right price if they can do anything at all right what shall they pay attention to in other words can business owners have any certain degree of control over how much the business is worth Marie yeah definitely I think you know on that uh, point you know, putting in a management structure into the business where the owner, you know, pulls themselves away from the day to day running of the business from all the client relationships and that there is another layer of management in there, I think is essential. Um, if, if a business owner is looking to sell their business in the near future, that's that's number one, in my opinion, definitely. So we're talking about several tires. Yeah. So, so from a from a management buyer perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so from, from my perspective, then look. We just recently did a management buyout, uh, myself and my business partner from the previous owner. Um, and I would say that it was it was a relatively easy process, especially talking to everyone in the preparation call about acquisitions and mergers. I think a management buyout definitely would be one of the easier of those three. And mm -hmm. I suppose it's, you know, we already knew the business. I've been working in the business, running the business for the last 11 years, um, my new business partner for the last nine years. So from a due diligence perspective, you know, we already knew all the figures. We knew I sit on the management team, I sit on the board. So I knew the business inside out. So it was much easier to buy a business that you're fully involved in. And I suppose, you know, I would hope um, and would be very surprised if there are, but there are no skeletons in the cupboard. You know, you've done all your due, due diligence over the years. Um, yeah. And from a, success, have, have a special... sorry, from a success perspective, then, you know, you already know your clients. I was always the face of the business. You know, the, the clients knew me. And even, you know, when, when the news was announced that we did the management buyout, I had a few industry colleagues come to me and say, wow, I, I thought you always owned the business. So, you know, I, I was always out there as, as the face of the business. The owner wasn't involved in the, the business. So, you know, from a client relationship perspective, nothing has changed because I've always been the main point of contact. Um, and from the staff perspective then and, and you know, the staff were very happy with 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 the the news um you know the management is staying the same the owner wasn't involved so i suppose you know when i look at it now and, and how it, it took about two months all of it and it was a lot of time and a lot of energy and you know we were exhausted at the end of it um and didn't really have the energy even to celebrate but you know what we want to do now is start looking at rigging up the business the same way that the previous owner did that it is a smooth transition if it's a management buyout or if it's a merger or an acquisition that it is much easier when you start planning sorry basically start planning from day one mm -hmm. excellent uh, anita the, the um, planning um is something you do if you indeed uh, know beforehand that you want to sell or you want to no. be prepared when a buyer comes around. And as I said, I was probably the most naive relocator in, in the business. Um, I loved it. I love what I do. Um, the, the best proof is I jumped in again. Um, so it's, uh, but very soon when we started talking, so I said the whole process was six months. 
when we started talking first, um, we were thinking of a merger because we were completely two completely different companies, no competitors of each other at all. Uh, one was working only global, the other one was only working direct custom, direct client. So wow. it was the perfect fit. Um, but in the course of, of the discussions during those six, six months, um, it shifted towards, yeah, do we need three bosses? Maybe one is better. And then we started talking about acquisition instead. Um, at a certain point, it was there was even a question mark, who's going to buy who? But um, as it evolved, I immediately in, um, brought in somebody who is, um, yeah, I'd say a professional, just like uh, Patrick in mergers and acquisitions, who did different calculations, who uh, made three possible uh, views of how you can calculate the worth of a company. And all three methods came to a very similar, uh, honest price. And um, But yeah, I think you need to involve somebody from outside and have it evaluated in, in a proper financial way, no emotions involved. Yeah, that, Patrick, you were going to say. Definitely, you, you, you need somebody outside for a couple of reasons. One is uh, in order to know how to arrive at a value. Um, it's very difficult for you to do it if you're too close to the business. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there is an actual formula. There is. There, is, there are various factors which are brought to bear, and you've got to know what these are. And thirdly, you, you, you've got to know, you, you've got to be able to factor in um, the, the, the real reason why the buyer wants to buy. And um, whereas, you know, that just helps you with, with getting a, a feel for what, what might be available to spend. And, um, and th these are all the things for which you need an outsider. But the other reason why it's good to have an outsider is because if, if, if you're trying to negotiate yourself, you're, 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 you're the last you're the last person. You're, you've got the final say. So if you say no to a figure that you might have accepted, then you can't really go back on your word. So you, you, you've got to have somebody saying, well, uh, this is the offer. And you say, well, I don't think that's enough for you you've got an idea of what you want and they say well i don't think we'd want to pay that and there has to be a mediator in between to bring the two sides together and th that's an important function yeah absolutely and and damien I, I, looking at that from the other side absolutely yeah <laughs> when, when you've embarked upon a potential takeover merger acquisition yeah. well, an acquisition are you going out into the market and looking at potential partners or uh, something to acquire? Or are you approached? Or is it both? Well, I, I, I'd say it's usually it, it's both. It, it can go both ways. Um, I think f for us, what is really important is, you know, we're when we do invest, we, we do it as a, as a strategic and, uh, you know, as a long term investor. So we're, we're not, you know, hedge fund type of uh, investing. So for us, you know, what was said earlier on, when, when we look at the company and, and how it's valuated and, and what is important, what, what I always find is what is crucial is really that the seller, um, be it the owners or the senior management, really think about wh where the value in the business is. There is formulas, obviously, to calcul calculate the financials, but I, I think in our industries, the values go way beyond um, just the financials and the, mm -hmm. the factors are, are really um, at all different levels. And I think to me, that is really the preparation or, or the, the, the thinking ahead besides having the people ready is, is really to think about where, where do you think your company is, is um, adding value? And that's where we then as a buyer can start to have discussions and, and can look at the opportunities and, and, you know, how when we bring the two companies together, those values, how can we leverage on them? How can we maybe multiply them um, by combining forces? So that, that's a bit how we approach it. Um, and, um, yeah, maybe a, a word to the mediator uh, again from the other side. Um, I would definitely agree that you know, for, for someone who has no experience or a limited experience with with the topic, um, to to get some assistance um, is, is very valuable. Um, where I, you know, where we prefer is is really talking regularly, talking to the owners. And I, you know, I 
I'm not always sure that having a mediator just always in the middle is the best way. After all, we're you know we're in the people industry, and and for us as an investor, it's absolutely crucial to to talk to the owners, to talk to if possible the senior managers in the company, because that that is what is going to drive the success in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Damien. But we enter a bit into, into uh, uh, more specific details, right? Um, what exactly would be the main things that you're considering? Uh, okay, figures, uh, books, uh, EBITDA, the market share, the pool of clients. I would like to know if a lot, few large clients would matter, uh, would be would be better than several clients which are smaller. The reputation of the company. Do they? I mean, is is it a, something that you're taking into account or not? So more specific uh, um, things that you're considering. <laughs> so you want me to give yeah. away all our secrets? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no kidding. Um, look, I honestly, the first thing we try to look at is the people, um, because I always say we invest in people and not in companies. Um, and I, so I think be, before we start, uh, you know, really digging into the financials and, and uh, taking the EBITDA apart and, and so on, we, we need to get a feeling for the company, for the culture. And we, we've walked away from opportunities at that stage because there was no human fit. Um, we didn't even go into the numbers uh, in, in great detail. Um, but then after that, obviously, the financials are important and, and be, you know, the substance value you may have, the, the earnings. Um, and, uh, you know, the customer portfolio certainly is a, is a very important um, topic. And it's difficult to say whether, you know, a, a large portfolio of small customers is more, is more interesting uh, than a, a few big ones. But it's, it, it really depends a bit. And there is pros and cons on both sides. And what you, as a buyer, what you always try to do is, is sort of assess what are the risks and what are the opportunities associated with it, with the transaction, and, and you sort of have a, try to find a balance in, in there in between. I think just to lead on from that, um, Madalena, I would definitely agree with um, David that you know the people, because we're looking at some acquisitions at the moment, that the people and the culture of the company is extremely important that you're aligned, um, because if that's not there. I think it's a battle from the very beginning. Um, and then on you know, the clients, I think that very much depends on your strategy as a company, whether you're going after the smaller clients, the direct corporates, or whether it is your you know, third party RMC work. I think, yeah, it mm -hmm. depends basically on, on each company and what your strategy is to which direction you go. Yeah, that's amazing. And you mentioned, you mentioned mm -hmm. cultural integration. That's one of my uh, uh, questions, uh, right? So I will just uh, uh, continue on that, on that uh, line. Uh, sure, there are several types of integration, uh, leaving aside the technical integration part. Uh, the perfect cultural match, right, between two companies, uh, obviously, is fundamental for the future success of the new business. How can we assess that? How did you assess it? I would be really, really interested in learning that. How can you assess the culture of men? I think within a few meetings of the current ownership or management, you'll, you'll see that straight away. I, I think it's very obvious, in my opinion, and from my experience with meeting people over the last year or so. Anita? Yes, um, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to contradict that because you indeed feel uh, the atmosphere. You feel you have to not do it from a distance. I think acquisitions in, in Corona times are a bit more difficult than sure. they were before. Um, I believe in going into, into the office, into really yeah, talking to people. They don't need to know why you're there. You can just be on a friendly visit. Um, but the culture in relocation in every single company is very strong and is very different. One company, we're, we're people people, uh, we deal with people, it's it's all the P word. There's nothing but people with what we do. Um, and that brings relationships, not only with the expats or with the suppliers, also the teams are very strong. And um, it's, you should not underestimate the differences in culture from one company to the other where the people have worked for 20 years together. It's a, it's like um, replanting an old tree. I love that. 
That's a really good analogy. That's a really good analogy. And again, so because I'm fascinated by this, and Tracy, you put a, a, a you know a comment there, which was really interesting. That you know, I'm fascinated by culture in terms of intercultural integration. You know, from one country to another, how we're moving people all around the world, how people are settling into different cultures. But when you then throw in the, I mean, Damien, you you know, you've you've brought com companies in very different cultures to the to the culture. Of, of Switzerland, both in terms of business culture and in terms of personal culture. How do you square that up? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, to be perfectly honest, we we were a bit naive in, in our first attempts because uh, our first step was into Germany and we thought that's just like Switzerland, um, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in general, I, I think our philosophy is, you know, when we do invest, when we, when we do buy a company, we we, we invest in a company that has quality, that has quality people. Um, so I, I think the first thing we do is actually do not too much. Um, so we, we really try to understand the culture of a company to get a feeling for it. What Anita said earlier on is, uh, you know, to, throughout the due diligence, but even in the first phase of the integration, really try to grasp uh, um, what what is there and, and what made the company as successful as it, as it has been. And, and as an investor, we would you know we would it would be a mistake to change what has made the company successful so um but then over time clearly it is it is a it is an attempt to then maybe align things and and bring in you know bring in from both ends and and you know we, we've integrated elements from from the companies we've acquired across the whole the whole group and we certainly brought certain things from our mother company and in, in, into the other company so we, we we really talk more about alignment um rather than integration um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And Marie, you mentioned earlier that you're you're, you're looking at expansion um, within the same marketplace. Uh, yes, within the same yeah. marketplace. And again, do you see you know because like Anita said, you know you're 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 operating a, an M and A within the same marketplace, but there are still profound cultural differences in the co com in the companies, right? Yes, definitely. And and from conversations I've had, you know, I know straight away um, that culturally it wouldn't be a fit, you know, and I've had one or two conversations and I've known that, okay, I'm not going to progress this any further. Um, and I'm not saying that you know straight away and then everything will be perfect after that. But I think, I suppose, you will know straight away which companies won't be a, a good cultural fit. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think as you go down the line and, and, and further into the process, then you will come across obstacles along the way. But definitely, I think you can filter out um, the companies you think that it'll be just too difficult um, to merge or, or acquire a company because the culture is so different. Mm. Mm -hmm. Bindu puts a really interesting point in the, in the I've worked closely with a leading American medical company that bought over $450 billion company in India and the cultural challenges were huge. And just on, on that score, I'll dig it out and I'll put it on, on our website, but there is a fascinating um, report into the failure of Walmart to move into Germany. It's about 10 years ago now. Um, and it all came down to the inability of the American company to to culturally fit with with the German business culture, and I just find that fascinating. Madalena, sorry, I could go on. Thanks, that. thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, there are a couple of things um, that I'll be super curious to find uh, uh, to find the answer to. So, I have I have two two related questions here. Um, I'm very far from being an expert on this, obviously, but all the good books apparently out there tell us that if a business is totally dependent on the owner that's not a healthy business model, right? Uh, the first question would be, are business owners trying to, uh, uh, business owners that are trying to sell their companies, uh, are they associated with the cost during such a merger and acquisition process? Are they evaluated or assessed separately from their businesses? And if so, how are they assessed and evaluated? And the second question uh, that comes up uh, uh, related to this would be the emotional component, because Patrick mentioned a bit earlier, right? So the value a business has in our industry includes a huge emotional component in our industry. Many owners having worked their whole professional lives in creating, developing, and, and, and uh, growing their, uh, that, that, that business with passion and enthusiasm, and their whole life is in it. Can this be quantified in cash, right? Can we attach a price to it? Um, is this taken into account during the valuation? Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, does Anita want to answer that? Go ahead, Patrick, go ahead. You have no experience. Yeah, yeah. you know, the, the owner and the value of the owner, uh, there, are, there are values and they can add and they can subtract to the value. For a start, when, the, um, when a new owner buys a company, it's assumed that the old owner won't be there anymore. So, uh, so it would be very wrong for the old owner to uh, try to promote themselves as being the life and soul of, of the uh, business and uh, the most important person in it. The most important people in the business, as Damien said and Marie seconded, is the most important people are the, are the people who work in the teams and in the management. And I think this is where something like uh, if you've got your equality seal or if, you, if you've got a, a, um, one of those accreditations which sets out how, how the business is actually managed, that's terribly important because you have to show that it can be managed without the owner. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that when the owner actually leaves the business, the owner has usually been a very high cost to the business going along because they take high high salaries and then they they put a lot of expense through and uh, if those if that cost can be added back to the value of the business then uh, and then multiplied by the multiplier it can affect the value of the business very positively and that, that's something where uh, you need somebody who knows how to do that to do it for you mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. That is fascinating. I mean, it's it's again from from your point of view, Patrick. When when you were selling, um, how important was making sure that the management team were were seen as being, you know, able to fill your you know your very large shoes? Oh yeah, you've got you've got to show that the management team is uh, is able to run the business and that that you've got all all the bases covered on uh, accountancy, operations, uh, you know, finance, and and control you, you've got to be able to show that 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 is all working independently of the owner mm -hmm. and that um and having the teams and having having a sort of a management uh pyramid that you can that you can demonstrate because the the purchaser whether it's your own employees as a management buyout they have to be funded so they've got to be able to show whoever's funding them uh, that the business is going to continue to run without the input of the owner or if it's if it's another company that's buying uh, they certainly will want to be able to see that um, they're not buying an owner managed company where they give the owner the money and then he just rides off into the sunset mm -hmm. with the money and the business and they left with uh, a bunch of people looking for direction so um, so these are important things, you know, definitely. Excellent. What about the emotional component, Patrick? Um, how do we quantify the blood and sweat? How do we quantify the what? The blood, the blood sweat. and sweat. Yes. The profits. It should, yeah, it should reflect on the books, I was about to say. The blood, sweat and tears, Patrick, that you've put into building the company. Yeah. How do you get that? The emotional component. Oh, how do you evaluate blood, sweat and tears? Well. Yeah. Unfortunately, blood, sweat, and tears uh, uh, can have a huge value in the mind of the owner, but it, it doesn't translate into money. Um, uh, the blood, sweat, and tears, and the passion that that, that that is in the business has to be visible within the, uh, the the staff, and that's where Damien was saying as he walks into the company, uh, he can, he can he can sense that the culture and the attitude and the enthusiasm is there or what are if, it, if it's absent and um, so you, you you've got to have that trickle down uh into your staff and and not be totally concentrated in the owner mm. Mm. Excellent. fascinating and anita how how was that from your point of view i mean because i guess i'm i'm just thinking about you know what 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 Euro has been and it's not our company and marie coming back to a comment you made earlier which is you know people thought that that e i was already your business and people very often think that Euro is it belongs to Tadmai, which clearly it doesn't. But Anissa, again, from that point of view, the, the emotional 
bind that you have to something that you've that you've built how i mean was that was that a factor for you did you were you able to leave it mm, i negotiated a deal where i could stay on a year and a half i was gonna <laughs> ask that yeah okay i had to take time yeah. to grow out of it honestly sure. um like I said, it was a, a fantastic team, a very horizontal structure. Um, at the end of 20 years, a bunch of friends, really. So, yeah, you want to make sure they're OK. Um, and it, well, it, it was I was then a president of URA in that period of time. So it was beneficial, I think, to the to the buyer to have that presence um, within their company name attached to it. And all that made that I stayed for a year and a half and that it was gradual, no shock, no cultural shock. <laughs> so that that was, in my case, the best solution. Mm. And, and Damien, in your acquisitions, how how much does that factor in? You know, having a, a like a, a smooth transition of the of the senior leadership. How has that been? Well, I um, again, it depends a bit, a little bit on on what the owners want and and whether I, I think you know the context is it is it a transaction uh, as part of a succession uh, or is it you know are we more looking into type of merger type of situations? So I I think that has a big impact and um, but I I think it's very important that the owners before they load or while they prepare for the sales process they you know become clear themselves what what they want what what role do they foresee for themselves uh, are they ready to let go and um you know f for f as anita said that that ha sometimes has to happen within a very short time frame so you might need a bit more time afterwards for us whenever possible we we like to have a transition period where you know we can have the, the current ownership or at least you know in if the owners can't stay or we're not involved beforehand we we try to make sure that we can uh, keep the senior management on board for a certain time period because in our business obviously what, what really drives the value of the company is the customer relations and is the employee relations and and those both both of them you know are tightly um tied to the to the current senior uh, management so we you know we've if it was an opportunity where the owners would just say, well, we just uh, sell and then leave tomorrow and we don't know what our staff is going to do, um, that's probably not an opportunity we would follow up uh, on. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Do, Madeline, do you mind if I just drill down into, because you mentioned when we were talking actually yes. earlier in the week about um, the, uh, the context within which the merger or the acquisition or the management buyout yes. is happening. Um, so... I'd love to look at that. So, I mean, you've got many different um, reasons for why for why this is going to go ahead. And, and Damien, you mentioned a couple when we were talking earlier, and specifically succession planning. Has that been something which has been very relevant in your takeovers, your mergers and acquisitions? Yeah, I I think it, it was said earlier on. I I think our industry is at the point where you know a number of successions um, are you know are happening. So yes, a lot of opportunities are linked um, to successions um, that we've been looking at, and um, you know the, they are very interesting because very very often they are well managed, well run companies who have a great reputation. And um, I saw a comment earlier on about the blood, sweat and tears that really do translate into reputation and market right. positioning. Yeah. Um, but it is then really a matter of, you know, is there a team there that can support and, and sustain for the future? And, and I think that that for us is, is very important. And Marie, you mentioned that you're already thinking about your succession planning, having, you know, done the management buyout and, you know, with uh, what I'm sure will be many, you know, future years of success. Why is that so important now? Because I just think that, in in our opinion, myself and Aideen, you know, we need to start looking at that now. And you know, we're we're hiring for a senior position at the moment, um, and for for you know, our recruitment moving forward should be looking at having layers under us, layers of supervision, management, so that you know, when the time comes and, you know, as you said, and hopefully it won't be in the, the near future, it'll be a good few years down the line. Um, but who knows what will happen? You know, at least we have a structure there and people growing up to, you know, what we want really is, is for our staff to be cleverer than us and to make us redundant down the line. And that may be a good few years down the line, but we have that 
succession coming up within the business. You're a brave, brave person, really. <laughs> Which is quite right. <laughs> Patrick, yeah, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, you know, you've got to, um, you, you, you've got to build your layers of management and uh, execution of the business so that you can show how you deliver your product. And um, you've got to have your systems for delivering uh, your, your services and have the people there who can do it. And um, putting all that training and layers of management into place is something that you, you, you've got to begin as early as you can if you're hoping eventually to uh, turn it into um, a, a pension of money. Uh, at some time in the future. Excellent, uh, Patrick. If I may, if I may uh, uh, address my question, uh, my next question to you as well. You mentioned a bit earlier. Um, well, you underlined the uh, the importance of, of uh, an outside valuer, right? An outside assessor that can secure, um, uh, mediate, and facilitate the process. Um, is there a need for an objective measure, some sort of yardstick? Um, how do we well, by which such such assessors and such evaluators would measure the structure of a business in our sector, right? And thinking, yeah. for example, you, yeah. you, you have to apply a yardstick to uh, profits. You know, the, the the value has to has to be has to be based on on uh, the earnings. That's probably the only way. Certainly, the, the value of the uh, of the staff and the value of the um, of the the, the attitude of the company and the reputation of the company and the value of all of those things, mm -hmm. the, the, the real impact that they make is on maintaining the profits. It, so really, you're going to buy the company or you're going to sell your company uh, according to a multiple of the profits that you've been earning over the past year or an average um yeah. Um, what was the period of time? That was my next question. So three years or one year? Well, really, you, 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 you try to plump for whatever is going to give you the best profit. <laughs> if, if you've had, if you've had a, a particularly good year and you think, you know, I'm not going to be able to repeat this too easily, <laughs> well, then you might, you might look to base the uh, valuation on that. And really, whoever is buying your company, they're going to look to try and uh, spread it over three years because they want to see what the average is over three years. And they look into um, such things as the management accounts for each month over those three years to see how they all average out and what the peaks and troughs are over that period. Because you've got to remember that um, the, the, the valuers are the, the, um, the, 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 the buyer will have will have a gut feeling for the value he wants to put on the company but it all has to be proven to the uh, either to the backer if it's a, a management buyout they've got to be backed by a bank or by a, an investor um, and uh, if it's if it's a company that's uh, that's buying another company they they've got to justify it to their shareholders so they've got to show the formula by which they um, they arrive at a value and that's normally done by accountants and uh, professionals, and they they need to be able to prove what what they're arriving at. So they need to see figures, uh, see what 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 figures will be will will continue to be earned, and um, and and they and then they they arrive at, at the. The EBITDA at the uh, at the earnings upon which they will base their multiple. And Marie, can I come to you? Um, because that was, I mean, that's obviously been very key in your management buyout. And mm -hmm. Renee raises a really good question: Is there a motivation to purchase a company, and specifically for you as a management buyer, based on future earnings as well? Yeah. Well, in, in our particular example, we base it on the last three years EBITDA, mm -hmm. um, and came up came up with a multiple. And I suppose. <clears throat> Look, we were quite lucky. Um, it was very amicable, and the owner was quite generous to us and gifted us shares for you know our time in the business. Um, and it was solely just based on the EBITDA over the last three years, and I managed to negotiate a little bit off that as well. So, look, I suppose it's 
you know, it all depends on the motivation of the seller. Um, and, you know, the seller of our business, he wasn't selling to retire. He had several businesses, just wanted to kind of, you know, set off a few and not be as busy as he was and focusing on too many things. So it wasn't, you know, he wasn't pushing to get the best price. And I suppose he saw that we were nine years and 11 years in the business. We were the face of the business. We built the business up for him. So, you know, he was very happy with, I suppose the industry standard and then even us negotiating a little bit less than that so the future earnings didn't come into the equation interesting oh very interesting and anita can i come to you because patrick you mentioned before the importance of having like external accreditations feedy fame euro global quality seal anita was that important for you um definitely yeah you were an early adopter of the of the quality seal yeah. yeah, we we kind of co-invented the thing, <laughs> didn't we, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, it it is very important. I and I, I was going to say at first in Europe, but I think now it's a worldwide recognized and accredited uh, quality seal. It has all the elements in it to evaluate a company. Um, you can cut it into pieces according to every paragraph and, and topic and that those are all the things you need to look at. Those are all the things that need to be there. And I think I can say without any doubt, I would not have paired up with a company that would not have the quality seal. Um, and anything above that, like uh, more trainings uh, would be a plus the the mims are there there's so many modules to choose from and at the same time i also wanted to, to pick on one of uh, the things that uh, patrick said the backer um with the evaluation uh i remember that the banks not only wanted to see the figures of the last three years and evaluate for their for themselves but also meet the management team mm -hmm. they wanted to see whether that could be a constant going forward um, rather than them just disappearing the next morning and leaving it decapitated. So that was a, a really important point, Patrick, that we hadn't touched on the backers, the banks. Uh, they, for the loan, they have their own standards and uh, they pick and choose as well. Yeah, the money is very important. And, it has to be <coughs> and you usually find that whoever's producing the money wants to know that uh, it'll come back to them. And the only way it can come back to them is if the uh, the management can continue to manage the staff who will deliver the product which earns the money. And that is the, that is the bottom line. Um, and and every buyer every buyer is has to justify um, the price to either a bank or to other shareholders or even to themselves. And um, and they, they can only do that by having the figures all add up. And your quality seal is terribly important because, as Anita says, it 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 it, it breaks the whole company down into uh, showing the management structure, showing the systems, showing how the uh, all the compliance is in place, the licenses are there, everything everything that the uh, your quality seal analyzes uh, mm -hmm. it, it is there for 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 a, the is the basis for a merger an acquisition or an outright sale um and it has it all laid out and independently verified so it, it's a great shortcut and i think just adding on to that and and dom what we spoke about last week i think having a, a good board in place yeah. you know a well governed and structured board with non-executive directors I think that will help as well with structuring and putting your company forward for a, a, a future sale, acquisition, or merger. Mm -hmm. It just all it all builds the faith, right, to the to the buyer. I'm assuming. And Damien, would you would you back those up? That you know that makes your life. If you're going into an acquisition, that makes things simpler for you. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I I think as a buyer, you we tend to look more at the future earnings. Um, <laughs> which obviously you know which is what you're going to base your acquisition cost on and, and that that's how we you know as a, as a buyer you look at things but 
what will help in that context is obviously you know if you have those systems in place if if the governance is good if the you know with the quality seal there is a, a proven management system in place that that will give you faith that you know the stability in the company will be maintained and and whatever you it, you know whatever you estimate those earnings at that they will be sustainable for the future and and i think that from a buyer perspective is is what really matters and um, and what we base our evaluations on Hmm. That's There's amazing. A, That's really, really important. Has come up there, um, which points to the um, to the way an RMC uh, and and a real estate company arrived at value, <laughs> and they I can see that they valued it at four times profit or average profit over the past three years, and. That is a good yardstick. That's a that's a good basis upon which to work, and um, and. Another point I would make is that whatever the whatever the value is, it should be paid. Having having a a, 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 a sale uh, which is dependent on an earn out over many many years or dependent upon, upon delivering in the future is not a good idea. Um, if 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 by some means uh, the uh, profits improve over the the following year or or future years um th those profits which th those additional profits are really uh due to the the new owner and they won't want to share them with the previous owner and uh so you you've got to set the value and that is the price at which you've got to sell and the new owner buy and uh that has to be it mm -hmm. I would obviously dare to slightly disagree from a buyer's <laughs> perspective. <laughs> um, no, I, I think you, you're right, Patrick, in, in many ways. And, and I think that has to be the basis. But nevertheless, I, I think, you know, there is constellations or, you know, there might be risk factors. Typically, if a lot is dependent on the owner, um, we have done transactions where we had certain, you know, customer retention clauses and, and elements like that, which you know make it a fair value so we say yeah you know the company is valued at a certain level absolutely but it is only valued at that level if we can you know sort of make sure that certain certain criteria are met so i think that that is really something that has been looked has to be looked into and and um, negotiated case by case and, and really depends on on the context of every individual um transaction you see you're speaking as a buyer Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know we're very close to time, but David Welch, thank you yep. so much for the really interesting comment. When the announcement comes out of a new merger, they usually discuss the benefits of consolidating the office or back-end systems to gain efficiencies and savings. Do you think there's a true benefit after some time, one to three years? Uh, is the savings more or less than anticipated? And I know, Madalena, that was something you wanted to discuss about integration. Uh, yes, but I think uh, I'm not sure if we have the, the necessary time anymore. <laughs> That's a whole it's like we have only two minutes. <laughs> uh, obviously, we expected uh, uh, this session. Uh, I mean, we can't we can't discuss such a topic in uh, in 15 minutes. That that uh, we just try to cover the main the main points. Um, I would have one question uh, briefly regarding the employees because that that that's really important. Um, what happens with the employees' engagement and the client's loyalty, right, uh, in such in such processes? Um, what were your experiences? Has anything changed? Um, are there any changes that you would expect or, or you should be prepared for? Marie, for example, in your case, right, were there any differences uh, uh, in your statute, right, uh, from from um, your previous statute and your current one? Yeah, no, there was no, look, it's only been a month and a half, but there hasn't been, the staff have taken it very well. You know, I was the face for the clients. So yeah, we, you know, we were very lucky and I think it was very smooth in our case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else would like to, to, to comment um, on that? Would you, would you say that uh, I, I, can, I can say that I've, always, I've been very, very happy with all of the deals that I have done where I've sold a business because interestingly, all of those businesses have gone on to become quite a lot bigger and uh, make an awful lot more money for the people who bought them. So they were win-win. Uh, I'd hate to have a situation where I sold something and uh, and and then saw it disintegrate. So uh, it, the the deal has to be win-win for for it to be uh, 
satisfactory all around. And that, that should that should be the objective when you're going into it. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the, the best uh, the best way to, to round it up, uh, go for win-win. I fully agree. Excellent. Um, I think I think we're preparing to wrap up the session, right? It's it's uh, um, it's time. Um, I would have like a final final question for everybody quickly. Um, like the main things considered when uh, a company is valued, right? The 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 answer to the question that everybody wants to find out the answer to, right? How is the company valued in our industry? Of course, we have shared many details, many insights for the past sixty minutes. Um, if we can make like a summary, uh, uh, top three things that should be considered when valuing the uh, company, please. I would say, well, the, the, the people, as Anita said, and Damien, the staff, um, your client contracts, processes, procedures, the EBITDA, that kind of some of the things anyway. I'll let someone else add a few more. <laughs> That's the mix. <laughs> yeah, you've got, to, you've got to establish the EBITDA. And you've got to establish that it can continue. And that is really the bottom line. Mm. Excellent. Interesting. I, I really do think that um, the comment that came in from David about the um, um, uh, consolidation and then integration, that's a whole session we ought to look at later in the year. So we'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> a different one. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. I think I think that uh, that wraps up our session. Uh, it's been it's been really really amazing. We had a lovely audience. Thank you a lot uh, for for taking the time to join us, uh, for the great insights you have shared with our audience. Thank you all for watching and being with us for your comments. Uh, in case you need further advice uh, or you have any questions, please reach out to our guests directly. I'm sure they will be happy to uh, to help. Meanwhile, um, please follow uh, Expat Global pages on LinkedIn and YouTube for uh, more updates on our new uh, new uh, new topics in the future. And I guess I'll see you all in two weeks' time. Thank you very very much. Thanks everybody. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Great to have you with us.